uh, I think there will be, there has to be a uh, change in the program tomorrow because we have also announced another lecture at 3.45. So I'm not sure whether the um, March will run into that program or not. So we need a rethink on the program tomorrow afternoon. <clears throat> Today, as you know, we are starting the second uh, series of lectures at the Freedom Square. Uh, we have entitled this series, Azadi, the many meanings of freedom. Uh, Azadi is a term which has come up in this movement, and we all felt that the term needs to be understood, unpacked, in the same way as we have tried to do with the category nationalism. Um, this series will try and explore uh, the many meanings in a variety of different ways. Uh, we'll look at the re philosophical reflections on freedom. We'll look at the way the category of freedom has evolved over time. We'll look at the way the category of freedom has mutated over time. We'll look at the way uh, social movements and cultural movements have resignified and reworked the, the term itself over time. Uh, how has Dalit, how have Dalit movements, Dalit uh, resistance, uh, women's movements, cultural movements re-signified and refigured the word? Uh, these are uh, themes which will evolve. Uh, these are themes which will be explored over the next three weeks. Uh, we have already planned out the program for the next week. Uh, the first lecture uh, today will be by Patu Chatterjee's. Um, as you know, Pathe Chatterjee has been associated with the Center for Social Studies, Calcutta and Columbia University. Uh, his, he is uh, at the same time a historian, a philosopher, a political scientist, a public figure, a public intellectual, and something you may not know, he's also, uh, he writes plays, and uh, his plays are um, staged in Calcutta uh, quite often. Uh, he's also... He writes on popular magazines, popular journals, newspapers, and his interventions are extremely important in the way social movements develop uh, on intellectual and academic issues. Uh, his publications are too many for, to, for me to list here, but some of them, which are familiar to everybody, I'll just mention. Um, nationalism as a derivative discourse, nation and its fragments, the black hole of empire, and the princely imposter. He has many edited volumes and a series of edited volumes on his own edited essays. Uh, to, uh, before I hand over to uh, Partha Chatterjee, uh, who will be talking today on the rights and wrongs of Azadi, I would like to announce that tomorrow's lecture on the series, which will be by Sanjay, Sanjay Hegde, uh, uh, will be held at 3.45 rather than 6 o'clock. We had announced it at 6 o'clock, but since the open hearing will be from 5 o'clock. We'll have the lecture here at 3.45, and then we'll move on to the open hearing at 5 o'clock. Over to you, Patu. Thank you very much, uh, Niradri, and thank you to the JNU students and teachers for inviting me to speak uh, at this, uh, on this occasion, the new series on Azadi, uh, I must also offer you my profound apologies for uh, the delay in my arrival. I believe uh, there were many others who had come and had to leave. Uh, I won't give you an, uh, a story about why and how it took me nearly 10 hours to come from Kolkata to Delhi because I am told that uh, making any disparaging remarks on the national airline has been declared unconstitutional. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Azadi is the topic. And uh, once again, I have to commend the students the genu, uh, for Restoring to a perfectly good Hindustani word Water bottle is side used, I think, in every North Indian language exactly, thank to uh, restore to it its full range of meanings. Because in the recent past, the word somehow had been reduced to a kind of label, 
and very often uh, even used pejoratively to mark out people associated especially with the movement in Kashmir. Uh, I think it is very important to understand that even that movement and movement, similar movements, are part of a much larger set of demands, uh, uh, claims, negotiations that have to do with the broader theme of freedom. Uh, and that will be my topic today. <clears throat> so one of the things that we are being told every day now is that freedom is not unlimited, that freedom cannot be absolute. Now this, it seems to me, is a fairly obvious thing. Freedom has never been absolute or unlimited. Everyone knows this. Uh, at a very basic level, there are surely natural limits to our freedom to do things. So, I am not free to run like Hussein Bolt, even if I wanted to. Uh, I cannot be at two places at the same time, right? I cannot jump from the roof and say I will fly to the moon. When I'm sitting here in, among you at this campus, I, I'm feeling I wish I had been 25 again. It's not possible. Uh, these are natural limits. There, there are natural limits which, within which we have to think of what we can or cannot do. But it's important to remember that by acting upon these natural forces, energies, movements, it is possible for human beings to creatively expand their range of freedom. That, in fact, is the very source of creative innovation. Uh, from basic things like production uh, to all of the developments of science and engineering, and technology and art, that is fundamentally what human beings do, which is act upon the various forces of nature in order to creatively expand the range of things one can do. So I said that, for instance, one cannot be at two places at the same time or, or cannot fly to the moon. Even that is, that is possible today, fly to the moon, uh, which is an expression of how freedom could be expanded by creatively using the forces of nature. But more often we tend to think of the question of freedom in terms of social and political constraints. And that will obviously have to be the larger part of our discussion today. Uh, let me begin by saying that these social and political conditions and the way in which freedom is limited by social and political conditions uh, have two different aspects which need to be thought of differently. One is the question of individual freedoms and the other is collective freedoms. And I will explain why I think we should think of those two things as requiring somewhat different uh, understandings. As far as individual freedoms are concerned, they are limited. They are limited in a lot of ways. Or let's begin, you know, rather than begin from some abstract theoretical uh, propositions, Let's begin with the way in which our present social and political uh, setup, broadly defined by, let us say, the Constitution, uh, how that defines individual freedom. We all know Article 19, which gives us 
the right of freedom to speech, to movement, to residence, to uh, what is it, three or four different things, right? Uh, each of them is actually limited. Some of these limitations are in the Constitution itself. So, for instance, speech, for instance, is specifically limited in the Constitution by specific other provisions. Uh, they are also limited by other laws which have been passed by Parliament. But if you think of the broad range, let's think of speech again. It is not as though we are free to speak anything, anywhere, in any setting, in any situation. Right? So, for instance, what is acceptable speech, let us say in a gathering of young males, would not be acceptable in a mixed company. Right? What can be said on the sports field cannot be said in a classroom. We can think of many, many situations. What can be said in front of elders is different from what can be said among one's own peers. These are specific institutional sites where there are specific conventions, practices, which restrict what is acceptable speech and what is not. We all accept this. In each of these cases, there are authorities which regulate this, which impose this, sometimes even punish. We've all gone through this. Even punish people for inappropriate speech. We should also remember that these conventions or practices undergo change, which obviously means that these practices are often challenged, they are questioned. Over time, we can easily see, for instance, even in our own uh, experience um, over the last decades or, uh, you know, for instance, think of uh, what might have been acceptable speech for an upper caste person uh, speaking to a lower caste person maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, would not be acceptable today in many public spaces. That is a change. These changes have come about because, of course, <coughs> conventional practices have been challenged, they have been, new claims have been made, and very often the conventions and practices have changed. The crucial thing to remember is that in these kinds of settings or situations, the, the state is not the agency that regulates, right? What is said or what can or cannot be said inside a family, what can or, can or cannot be said in a private gathering, what can or cannot be said even in a, in a society, in an association, in a club, in a, even in a public meeting, is not something that is meant to be regulated by the state. Right? Now, the interesting question, therefore, is what does the state guarantee? So, think of a situation where, let us say, in a community, where the community elders claim that their conventional social practices prevent young women from going out into town or studying in a college with male students. Right? They are trying to impose a certain conventional practice. That practice may come under challenge. Right? The question is, if that young woman goes to the state and claims protection of her individual freedom, the state is bound to guarantee and protect that person. In other words, what I'm saying is that in a constitutional democracy, when there is a question of, let us say, freedom of speech, or freedom of movement, freedom of association, any of these freedoms that are guaranteed under Article 19, the default position of the state must always be to protect individual freedoms. 
There may well be exceptions. These exceptions may be negotiated. There may be court rulings. It could, it could be subject to dispute. But as I am saying, the default position must always be that the state protects individual freedoms. If it does not, then really it is no longer a constitutional democracy. It becomes tyranny. There is, there is no other. That is, in fact, the definition of tyranny, where the state does not protect individual freedoms. This will be important in the case of the, of the university, for instance. In fact, I will suggest that in the case of a constitutional democracy, there are two institutions in particular where freedom of speech must have a special protection, must be given special protection. One are bodies of elected representatives, such as parliament, such as the state assemblies. And we all know that, in fact, that is the accepted legal position, that in parliament or in assemblies, what can or cannot be said is regulated by parliament itself or the state assembly itself. Not even the courts can decide. That is understood as parliamentary privilege. I would claim that the university should also have a similar status. It is important because just as the people's representatives are precisely the place where demands and claims and contestations of, that occur in society at large are in fact put before the state. The parliament or the assembly is the organ of the state which represents the sovereignty of the people. There is no other institution which does. That is the institution which represents the sovereignty of the people. And if that is the case, then in fact, those who have been elected by the people as their representatives must have complete freedom to say what they have to say in that house without any other organ of the state interfering. In the case of the university, the claim would be this, that if freedom of thought and expression is the foundation of any kind of critical and creative thinking in society at large. And this, can, this means the entire range of things I mentioned to you earlier on at the very beginning when I said that the creative innovation to expand human freedoms, that depends fundamentally on knowledge, on the ability to use knowledge, to use that knowledge critically, to question existing rules, conventions, institutions. That is the basis on which science progresses, on the basis of which critical thinking progresses, art progresses. And the university is in fact the one institution where this is precisely the job of teachers and students to promote this kind of critical thinking. As a result, it seems to me, one of the absolutely foundational implications of freedom of speech and thought and expression is that the university be completely self-regulated. That is to say, what can or cannot be said in a university what can or cannot be said in a classroom or a seminar or even a meeting like this. It is the authorities of the university, teachers and students together, who should decide what is acceptable and what is not. Now, everything is not acceptable. We all know this. Even in the classroom, surely there are things that are said which are irrelevant, 
things that are said which are confused, things that are said which are plain wrong. And of course, it is the duty of whoever is the institution, for instance, if it was in my class, I could certainly tell a student to say, look, this is why you're wrong, you better stop now. We'll move on to something else. But it is the university authorities who best know what is or is not acceptable speech within the university. I think it is completely not only wrong, but even impertinent for state authorities to decide what can or cannot be said in a university. Now, let's move on to one other thing, which is this question of can speech, any kind of speech, in a university campus, and we can extend that to other arenas of society as well, outside the campus too, uh, be declared seditious. Now the sedition question, I'm sure you've discussed this many times, I don't have to go into this in detail. Uh, the law as it exists is clearly incompatible with any kind of constitutional democracy that is based on the sovereignty of the people. It is simply incompatible. And the reason is this, that the law actually says it does not say even the state. It says government as established by law. And one understands why it was framed that way in, in the 1860s when it was first framed. The government at the time, the colonial government, was of course external to the people over whom the government ruled. The government was an outside entity, which is why there was no question, obviously, of representation. The government did not represent the people of India. Now, as a result, it is perfectly understandable why any kind of expression of disloyalty or disaffection would have threatened a colonial government, and therefore, the colonial government could lay down that incredibly broad scope of what is or is not seditious. Even speech is seditious. But that is a law which has continued, and we can, I mean, there are very interesting things uh, about why, for instance, in the 50s and 60s, this law was very seldom used, in fact, and that is obviously because of this of its association with a, an entire history of nationalist struggle where virtually every nationalist of any description was at some time or other charged with sedition. So in the 50s and 60s it was in fact rarely used. It began rampant even though the courts have repeatedly said that there must be a distinction between advocacy and incitement, right? The courts have repeat. The courts have never quite gone to the extent of saying it is unconstitutional. Although some of the judgments almost seem to go that far, uh, but they haven't. What they have said is that mere speech and even advocacy cannot mean sedition. You have to show the actual imminent threat, the imminent threat of harm or injury to the state. Now, we all know that many of these cases, these sedition cases, don't actually stand up in court, but it is a widespread, there is a widespread use of that act to harass, intimidate, and threaten people. Any kind, according to that law, any kind of opposition to government, and remember, the government means any government elected by the people, right? Any go the government of the day, any statement that 
is deemed to be critical or claiming disaffection or inciting, not, not inciting, uh, advocating uh, dis um, disaffection towards the government of the day, which means any kind of opposition to the government, can be declared seditious. It is, I think, an act which certainly must go. That is a claim that needs to be made repeatedly. <coughs> Let me now move on to from individual freedoms to something like collective azad. Okay? And let me begin by saying that this understanding of a collective notion of freedom or azadi, something that pertains to an entire group, is actually difficult to make, it's difficult to contain within a strictly liberal understanding of, of the Constitution. Because, as we all know, the liberal understanding is fun fundamentally based on a notion of individual freedoms. So a collective freedom is always difficult to formulate in strictly liberal terms. But there are certain kinds of collective rights that historically have been recognized, even within liberal constitutional systems. And what the most obvious one is the question of national self-government or self-determination. Now this has happened, of course, through an entire history of anti-imperial and anti-colonial struggles that this right has been accepted, accepted to the extent that the United Nations, for instance, this is one of the declarations uh, that is part of the history of the founding of the United Nations, uh, the right of all peoples and nations to self-determination. But when one thinks of collective freedoms, I think it is important to understand that it rests on something, and this is slightly different, which is why I, I was saying, that individual freedoms and collective freedoms, azadi in the individual and collective sense, have to be thought of somewhat differently. Because in the collective sense, it actually depends on a certain relationship of an oppressed side and an oppressor side. If you think through this idea of collective freedom, you will find that in every case, the claim to some collective right to autonomy is based on a perception that there is an oppressor who is holding a particular group in subjection. That is what is contested, resisted, and that is the foundation of a claim to self-rule or autonomy or self-determination. If you think of the history of uh, anti-colonial nationalism, this becomes obvious. That anti-colonial nationalism basically is founded on the idea that there are oppressor nations and oppressed nations. And it is the right of the oppressed nation to claim self-determination or independence from the oppressor nation. We all know that through the history of the anti-colonial movements, this right of national self-determination has been, by the, let's say, the second half of the 20th century, this right was more or less universally established. But it's important to remember that this right was established 
in a way that had two very specific <coughs> characteristics. First of all, it was a resolution that was territorial. The national self-determination or national autonomy was always conceived of as a claim over a particular territory with clear boundaries. This is, there are, there are all, there's a whole history to be um, described here of how this idea of nations as having territory, territorial boundaries emerged in Europe, you know, through maybe from the 17th century onwards uh, and was carried on to the rest of the world through the colonial empires, in fact, where the colonial empires between themselves drew boundaries to define which was which part of the world belongs to which colonial part. Some of you may know of the of the infamous Berlin Conference of what is it, 18, uh, 1885, where on a basically on a drawing board, the various imperial powers sat down and divided up Africa. One of the peculiar things you will notice if you look at the map of Africa is that most of the boundaries are along lo longitudes and latitudes. They are simply drawn on a map, right, and divided up. This is French, this is uh, Portuguese, this is uh, British, etc. Uh, now, so the territorial jurisdiction, a unique sovereignty over a territory, is the first characteristic. And the second characteristic is the claim, and this of course is a more recent claim, this is the success of the anti-colonial movements, to claim that all sovereignties are formally equal. Which explains why in the General Assembly of the United Nations, every member state, irrespective of whether it is large or small, has exactly one vote. Which signifies the formal equality of all nations the sovereignty of all nations. Now, the reason I explain this is because if you then look at how collective claims are negotiated within the boundaries of a nation, you will find that in fact the same structure is replicated. So, for instance, think of countries where there are separate units that form, together form a federation. So there are many federal countries in the world, including India. The degree of federation, how much the sovereignty is divided up, what is the proportion of in which power is divided between a central government and the various state or provincial governments, that varies. But if you again look at why there are claims that there should be a separate federal unit, why does it come up? You will find that it is once again the same claim of an oppressed side and an oppressor side. If we look at the history of the Indian state or the Indian federation from the time of independence, and you look at the various claims that have been made over time, some of you may have read about the anti-Hindi agitation in in the Tamil areas, in Madras, right, led by Periyar, where in fact a specific claim was made that the Tamil part, Tamil speaking parts should secede from India. It was a claim that was made at the time. And of course, both the Congress in Madras as well as the rest of many op sections of opinion, the rest of India thought this was, this was a threat to national unity itself. Now, the interesting thing to note is that 
claims like this and their resolution are never permanent. There is never a permanent claim, nor is there a permanent settlement. The Tamil case is interesting because, of course, that movement of the early 1950s, we now know, later became completely incorporated within the framework of constitutional electoral democracy in the form of the, well now, the two main Dravida parties, which are inheritors of Tamil nationalism, but no longer considered a threat to national unity. Think of the Andhra movement, 1954, demanding a separate state for the Telugu-speaking regions, which, of course, then led to the entire demand for reorganizing all of the provinces of India into linguistic states, the States Reorganization Commission. Uh, by 56, all, most of the states were then began this process of redrawing the boundaries of the states according to linguistic regions. Even Nehru was opposed to this because he thought this would break up India. The, the recognition of the linguistic principle as the principle of federal divisions would break up India. Well, Nehru was wrong, we know, because it was not a threat. You move on to a whole range of claims which later became the basis for dividing up existing states into smaller states, right? Jharkhand, Telangana. Telangana is a very interesting case because if you now compare it with the Andhra case of the 50s, right? In the 50s, one might have thought, well, the regional demand, the cultural claim to autonomy has been resolved because we now have an Andhra state based on language. Well, Telangana comes up. I remember a time in the 1970s and 80s when the demand for Telangana, the demand for Jharkhand were opposed because the claim was these claims would simply lead to the breakup of the country. It didn't. Telangana is now a separate state. Jharkhand is now a separate state. right? There is a demand, for instance, in Darjeeling for the Gorkha peoples to have their own state, right? The interesting thing is that the present ruling party is, has been for the last 10 years representing Darjeeling in parliament. This same Gorkha land movement is represented by a BJP MP. So, you can think of how these kinds of claims actually work. The point, therefore, is that in each of these cases, whether it's Jharkhand, whether it's Telangana, whether it's Gorkhaland, everywhere the claim is that there is some fundamental injustice that is being done to a collective group which has its identity. There is some oppressor group outside which is oppressing it. And the claim is that this group must have the, the right to form its own political entity. In other words, sovereignty of the state, of the nation state, must be divided up further territorially. That sovereignty must be devolved to this oppressor group, to, to this currently oppressed group, in order to make it free. Azad. You can connect this whole discussion to claims that are now being made in the Northeast, claims that is being made in Kashmir. Now, of course, that's an old, you know, more than 60 years that the problem in Kashmir has not been resolved. 
what I'm suggesting is that there is nothing special or supremely dangerous in these claims. These are claims that have been made, that are being negotiated right now. And the argument that somehow a claim to a separate identity, no matter what the specific, the specific form of the resolution will depend on the politics, the politics that is allowed. If constitutional politics does not allow a certain kind of claim to be made, well, unconstitutional means will be taken. That is the nature of politics. But this is what I am arguing that if, in fact, national self-determination is so obvious and sacrosanct, then the devolution of that sovereignty, territorially, within the nation-state, within the boundaries of the nation-state, cannot be opposed. That is a negotiation that continues, and it's, an, it's a negotiation that ought to be allowed space. This, therefore, is the problem I have about people who say that any kind of talk of azadi in a collective sense is somehow anti-national and advocating the breakup of the country is simply false. It is simply false because as I have been saying, each single case from the time of the demand in the Tamil regions to Telangana to the linguistic states to all of the smaller states like Charkhand and so on and so forth have all been placed on essentially that same claim. Let's move on to something else that is relevant here. Which of course deals with the specific question of who it is that can declare a particular demand or claim as anti-national. Now, there is really no constitutional body or constitutional provision, right, which declares any kind of renegotiation of the terms of the constitution of the state as unconstitutional. There is no such thing. We have been told recently that somehow the Constitution is inviolable. No question can be raised about the Constitution. It's a very uh, peculiar claim to make. Because if that is so, then no amendment of the Constitution would be possible. Surely any amendment of the Constitution will require questioning this or that provision of the Constitution. Otherwise, why is ever a demand for an, a, a constitutional amendment made? As I said, every single claim of forming new states requires a constitutional amendment. It changes the constitution of the country. In fact, if you think of it, from 1947 or 1950, if you take the inauguration of the constitution as essentially forming the birth of the nation-state as we know it. These changes in the internal constitution of the state itself has changed the nature of the nation-state. The Indian nation-state in, as it was in the 1950s is not what it is today. This is a, an entire historical process that has gone on and that will go on. The claim actually that is being made today, it seems to me, is not so much 
that there is a threat of any kind of breakup of the country. That is not the claim. What is being claimed by a ruling party is that we will define what is the content of the national and we will identify people who will be put to the test of proving that they are not anti-national. That is what is being claimed. If you think of what is being attempted here, you will find this is this is completely con compatible with the very definition of fascism. This is what fascist parties have always done. To identify people, target people, and then ask them to prove that they are not international. If we move on, one final set of questions, uh, issues, and then I will stop and you can take questions. Uh, which is the connection between what I spoke of as individual freedoms and these collective freedoms. Now the individual freedoms and collective freedoms, I said, should be understood differently. But there is a connect con connection between the two. Because the claim to individual freedoms, a collective movement, this also is important to understand. Many of these individual freedoms, such as speech or movement or um, livelihood and so on and so forth, depend on things like income, occupation, status in society, right, dignity, all of those are supports or bases for the pursuit of individual freedoms or the enjoyment of individual freedoms, right? There is no point in saying that one is free to associate if one does not even have the basic means of subsistence. These therefore form the foundations of the pursuit of a free life as free citizens. But these individual freedoms, which may in some cases be acquired individually, cannot have a permanent effect on society unless entire groups, entire classes, entire communities can attain those levels of income and livelihood and health and education and all of those things. The connection is there. So as a result, what appears to be individual freedoms actually have a foundation in the collective pursuit of those freedoms, to be able to combine with others in a movement, in a collective claim for better incomes, for education, for health, for a life of dignity. Now, this obviously relates to questions such as caste and class and gender, because those are inequalities, deep inequalities, which make the pursuit of individual freedoms sometimes impossible. <coughs> 
all know that, yes, there are individual cases where people from certain persons, from extremely marginalized and impoverished backgrounds, communities, could improve their individual chances and attain that status of enjoying the freedoms that are offered by the Constitution, for instance. But those individual cases will not make a difference to the community as a whole. Right? So as a result, the argument that the collective pursuit of these <laughs> social and economic objectives is also a part of collective freedom, so collective azadi, is a very, very valid argument. Without it, individual freedoms cannot be defended. So therefore, there is a connection here then between these kinds of inequalities and sometimes in many of these cases, there is actual oppres oppression too. The difference with the cases we have spoken of earlier is that these kinds of relations of exploitation and oppression based on caste, for instance, or gender, cannot be resolved territorially. That is the crucial difference. You cannot have a territorial demarcation or a devolution of power and resolve the problem of caste inequality or caste oppression because there is no territorial solution there. It requires a different set of resolutions within the territorial framework itself, whether at the state level, whether at the national level, then these, are, these are questions of detail. But as I said, that even the question of individual freedom cannot be pushed forward without the question of resolving collective other, the problem of question of collective other, not simply of the ones that have a territorial resolution, but of the others, which is questions of such as caste and gender and class. Finally, let me end by saying why in all of this, I think the university in particular has a very important role to play in at least, well, maybe even three different senses. First of all, the university is the place where there is the full potential to collect and think about the knowledge of how people live, what people want, what people are claiming, all of these things can be observed and brought together in the form of analytical and systematically organized knowledge. That is the job of the university. This is not something that government departments can do. It is the university where this, this kind of collection of knowledge that you might say knowledge of the country. It is the university where knowledge of the country is actually critically examined and thought about. Which is why the place of the university is particularly important here. The second is, of course, that it's in the university that you can have a critical engagement of different points of view over these questions of individual and collective freedoms. It is in the university which offers that place.
for a serious engagement and even debates, the kind of debates that would not be possible in the political battlefield or a television talk show is possible in the university. And the third reason is, and this I think is a particularly important uh, point uh, in India, and especially for universities such as JNU, because the university is also a place where students, particularly students, but also teachers, from a variety of backgrounds, all of these different groups and communities and regions and so on that we have been talking about for so long. It is in the university that they come together. But not only do they come together, they come together in a place where knowledge, the serious pursuit of knowledge, is <coughs> what people practice. In other words, the, what the university allows for is the bringing together within a single space where people speak or are encouraged to speak in a common language, the language of whatever discipline or whatever science is being pursued, speak a common language people from different communities and regions and classes and castes come together and speak in that common language on a footing of equality. This is a particularly creative environment in which this kind of critical thinking about the country can be pursued. I do not think that there is any other institution in the country, which offers quite this kind of environment, which is why I, I which is why I, I think this, this, the assault that has come on the university is such a dangerous thing, and should be resisted with all the force that we have. I will stop here. And I'll be very happy to take questions. There was a question. There, 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 there. Where is the decision of the decision? Where is the decision of 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 uh, Rama, Rama, Hello. Actually, you spoke about the liberal theory gave you talking about uh, individual freedoms and you contrasted with collective freedoms and also uh, constraints like caste, class and gender. So, I would talk about uh, individuals within a collective uh, like freedom of speech, freedom of life chances. So, within a class society or within the market system, the life chances also gets constrained by market. So, don't you think there is a, if you expand the meaning of freedom beyond liberalism, so don't you think liberal theory is very limited when it comes to the concept of freedom? So, we have to want us to go beyond liberal theory. So, don't you think there is an inherent contradiction between freedom and capitalism. Now if we bring in concepts like democracy, also democracy and capitalism also there is a tension. So how do you also, when we want to expand freedom and bring in collective, so how do you explain the difference between capitalist democracy and socialist democracy? Uh, so thanks for your uh, lecture and uh, I have comment and question. So you had mentioned about the period and his uh, so-called anti-Hindi movement. But in my best knowledge, Periyar is not known for anti-Hindi movement. Rather, Periyar is known for self-respect movement, which was denied at that time to the deprived communities. And second, 
you have mentioned that uh, some section of the people are uh, saying that constitution is not amendable and you had said that yes constitution is amendable yes i know that constitution is amendable but the some section of people are opposing or they have fear that they want to amend the constitution to uh, limit their liberty and uh, uh, liberty and their uh, chances to get uh, jobs particularly in the government jobs no one saying that constitution is not amendable if they want to amend constitution that uh, see uh, those who are not implementing say for example the representation laws that we are knowing popularly as a reservation uh, is a criminal offense so no one saying that constitution is not amendable rather they, are, they have fear that they want to amend the constitution which will be uh, limit their uh, chances and uh, the last uh, my comment is that you had mentioned uh, about the freedom uh, sorry, uh, individual liberty to the deprived communities. Sir, in my best knowledge, uh, and sir, you are more knowledgeable to me, but I think that uh, individual cannot be liberated uh, themselves. Rather, the liberty uh, is coming in the community. So, uh, so, so whether I have liberty or not, or I have freedom or not, this will be define my birthplace. This will define my social location, and this will define my. Uh, what we say that from which community I am coming. So, this, sir, uh, this is my question and comment on your brilliant lecture. Thanks. Uh, sir, I have uh, two small questions. One is uh, when we talk about collective freedom, how do we see civil society and political society coming together for this kind of collective claims? And second is, uh, when we are talking about uh, new social movements, and this clearly comes under one of the new social movements, uh, then uh, how do we, how can we actually talk about the dimension of social media, which was not there before, and now it is very common. Thank you. Uh. So thank you for those those questions. Let me uh, let me take them one by one. About the courts. Now there is nothing in the laws of India which says that a court decision cannot be discussed or criticized in public. It is part of the individual liberties. There is no <laughs> so I'll, I'll repeat that in case you didn't hear me. About the courts, uh, there is nothing in the laws which prevents the public discussion and even criticism of a court decision. That is the law of the country. You can, anyone, can debate, criticize a judgment of even the Supreme Court. Of course, there is a whole appeal process which goes through the courts and so on and so forth. That is that is that is a different 